So today's lecture will be on functional genomics. Um, actually, since a lot of the class is on different functional genomic technologies, uh, today's lecture will be more specifically on uh, different ways of using perturbations to understand gene function. So as usual, don't uh, freely distribute these materials. The broad learning objectives for today are to really kind of just understand at a high level what the broad differences are between uh, forward and reverse genetics. Uh, most of the course is really, or most of this lecture anyways, is mostly spent on uh, talking about reverse genetics. Um, you should know how um, siRNA and CRISPR work. Um, in particular for CRISPR, you should know what a PAM sequence is, a guide RNA is, um, and you should know some, some of the basic practical considerations that uh, we'll talk about later in this lecture. Um, you really want to know what considerations you need to think about when you're trying to design, for example, siRNA that target specific mRNA with high specificity. So you need to know a little bit about, um, you know, considerations like how unique is, is a particular sequence for a particular gene or what happens when you have gene duplications or things like this, or alternative splicing. Um, you want to know the general advantages and disadvantages of both kind of siRNA based uh, gene knockdowns versus CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and you also want to be able to think about different ways to use CRISPR-Cas9 beyond just genome editing. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the many different applications that people have repurposed CRISPR-Cas9 for uh, beyond genome editing. So here we'll only, we'll only um, briefly cover what forward genetics approaches are, but basically the idea of forward genetics is that um, if you want to identify uh, you know, different regions of the genome that are responsible for giving rise to a phenotype, then one way to do that is basically to take a population of individuals uh, of an organism and basically randomly mutagenize different individuals um, and then observe the phenotypes of the individuals. From your population of phenotypes, you basically select out the phenotypes that are of interest to you, and then you go back and through sequencing or other approaches, you figure out what, mut what mutations you introduced that gave rise to those mutations, or gave rise to those phenotypes. And so uh, there's a broad spectrum of different approaches you can use to mutagenize uh, an individual. So they range from kind of very blunt, uh, very blunt approaches using, for example, like gamma rays, uh, to very kind of targeted approaches using transposable elements. And so on the end of, on the blunt end of the spectrum, uh, when you use uh, things like gamma rays to induce mutations, some of the basically what you tend to get are very big sort of large effect mutations. So those are like big deletions, inversions, or translocations. And so oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, for any given individual, you're actually disrupting multiple genes or multiple regulatory elements or things like this. And so that can be beneficial in one sense because what that means is that uh, you don't need you don't need to mutagenize that many individuals in a population in order to have uh, your mutations in total cover most of the genome. Right, and so the chances of, you know, if there's, for example, if you're lucky and there's only like, say, one gene that uh, causes your phenotype of interest, then if you're randomly mutagenizing a population using gamma rays, um, the chances that at least one individual has a mutation that covers your gene of interest is pretty high. Um, the downside to that is that um, even though it's pretty easy to, even though it's fairly easy to get uh, at least a few individuals with a mutation covering your you know, the underlying gene of interest, uh, it can be actually, it can be pretty difficult to actually locate the so-called causal gene that gives rise to the phenotype. Because the thing is that if, uh, if the only individuals that have a mutation covering your gene uh, basically have very large scale mutations, then uh, even if you identify what that large scale mutation is, you then still have the task of figuring out, okay, within this like large deletion, uh, which gene or which regulatory elements uh, of the set that were deleted is actually responsible for the phenotype. And so kind of in the middle of the spectrum, there's a wide range of chemicals you can use to induce basically smaller scale 
um, deletions, inversions, or translocations. Um, and so one of the nice things about using uh, one of like many of these kind of chemicals is that uh, your mutations are typically smaller than gamma rays. Um, they're still relatively randomly distributed around the genome. And so with enough individuals, you can be pretty sure you cover a large portion of the genome uh, in mutations. Um, some of the downsides to using like chemical-based uh, mutagenesis is that um, because the mutations are still like larger than like, say, for example, like single uh, base pair changes, um, it can still be pretty difficult to precisely locate the mutation. Um, and so finally, on the other end of the spectrum, you have um, insertions via things like transposable elements. And so here, uh, because of the way that, so we didn't really go over transposable elements uh, in the review lecture, but basically um, because the transposable elements have kind of known flanking sequences to them, uh, it's easy to positionally clone an insertion via transposable elements. Um, you can get a pretty broad range of mutations using transposable elements. Um, and uh, but one of the biggest problems with using transposable elements is that um, they don't really get inserted randomly around the genome. So transposable elements definitely tend to insert themselves in certain regions of the genome much more frequently than others. And so, um, for example, like the P element transposable element uh, in flies tends to insert itself in open chromatin. And so that's a big problem because, uh, you know, for any given... Uh, type of cell, um, large portions of the genome tend to be closed. And so if you're using like the P element, um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to, you know, do insertions in, in a large portion of the genome just because they tend to be closed. And so, um, yeah, even though you can easily position clone your mutations, you may not be able to mutagenize a large portion of the genome. And so some of the broad challenges of forward genetics are that, um, number one, for example, um, genes that are necessary for survival of your organism uh, may not have like a visible phenotype. You may not be able to mutagenize them uh, using forward genetics because as soon as you introduce a mutation that, say, for example, deletes a vital gene, then, then your individual isn't going to survive. So you'll never actually see that. Uh, you'll never see that mutant in a in a mutinized individual. Uh, number two, part of the problem is that you, you know, depending on what kind of phenotype you're looking for, if you're trying to screen like hundreds or thousands of individuals for a phenotype of interest, um, usually it's easiest to see um, certain types of phenotypes, like different types of you know effects on morphology. Um, or even like, you know, response to certain kinds of treatments. But there's many, you know, very subtle phenotypes, uh, like for example, molecular phenotypes uh, that you may not really notice or be able to screen for very easily. Uh, finally, uh, gene redundancy, gene functional redundancy and duplicated genes um, give you a lot of problems because say for example, like, you know, a lot of genomes, uh, including like the human genome, for example, has very large gene families where you have collections of genes that uh, are highly similar in function and in the way that they're expressed. And so if you have a lot of redundancy in your genome, which many genomes do, then if you just, you know, if you're just randomly knocking out, say, single genes, um, the redundant copies will kind of kick in. And so you may not observe an actual phenotype, uh, even though you've, in some sense, hit the correct gene that is involved in the function of interest. <laughs>